hello, welcome. Um, we're starting up for the moment, but not really going to be engaging too much just yet until people come in. Uh, for those of you that are here, obviously you're welcome to uh, talk with me if you like. But like I said, I'm not really going to get super into it just yet until um, I set up a couple things on this page. Uh, do give me a little bit of feedback for this particular session because I have a new setup going on where before in the last four episodes uh, everything was done with uh, my phone and that was it. Uh, so the mobile app was, was fine but the, I found that the video quality was kind of so-so. Um, okay so the mic is not that, is it low or is it loud or is it noisy? Kind of let me know as to like staticky. Okay let me see if I can bring it down. What if I brought it down? Is it better now? So I'm just kind of adjusting the audio right now real quickly. See if I can bring it down a little bit. Uh, we'll see if that gets rid of the static. Yeah, um, it's also a little bit further away. So I'm just kind of seeing what the best... Did it work better? Okay. Uh, so what happened was that my audio my decibel was really, really high. Um, so I just kind of brought that down. So hopefully got rid of the staticness, but you can still hear me okay. Um, a little bit muffled. Let me see if I can bring it in a little bit closer. And uh, hopefully that will make it a bit better. Being a little bit closer to me uh, might help adjust in terms of the muffleness of it. But um, again, I'm trying to get a sense as to like how this setup is going. Uh, before we just had our phone, so audio, all the audio was being recorded off my phone as well. Uh, but here we have an actual mic and also a camcorder, which is set up right above me. And I'm trying to get a sense of like how it's feeling so far. The video quality should be much better. Um, and the audio I thought would have been better as well too. Vibrating? Okay. I'm wondering if there's anything in my audio input that can help this. But give me a second as I kind of slightly adjust a couple things. I just want to see how things are going to run. Video, audio. Let me even turn this turn off the music a little bit too. Maybe that will help. And you're probably gonna get a lot of noise from um, just background stuff, like the computer noise and whatnot. The fan of it. So I'm hoping this will be okay, but we'll see what happens. It, hopefully, it's not terrible. Oh. Sorry, audio just kind of kicked out. So that's also another problem. Is that it does seem to go to sleep. So give me a second as I kind of <laughs> play with this a little bit. This is a, a new um, session, so I'm going to make sure I get everything right. Power save. Off. Okay, hopefully that will fix that problem, because uh, the camera goes to sleep. So. Uh, let me just check one couple last things with the audio and see if there's anything else I can do. Hopefully, like I said, it's not too bad. Um, audio sample rate. Uh, it kind of looks like I can't really change anything unless I um, start up the program again later on. So for now, I think I'm just going to keep things as they are. Uh, one second here, looks like there's nothing ready. Stop audio. And everything should be working okay. Let's see if that will do anything. Anyways. There's a couple of people in here. Um, again, for anyone that else is joining, just any additional feedback in terms of video, sound, anything like that, please just kind of let me know ahead of time um, as I adjust this. When I up re upload this into the uh, Twitch stream, I'll probably edit this section out, so don't worry about that. Uh, what I have right now set up on the page is um, a couple of demos I'm going to be doing. 
that pertains to uh, the class that I do teach in the dynamic sketching approach. And we, I just kind of cover one. Uh, did it make it worse? <laughs> Let me go back to what it was before. Audio. Default, default. I kind of send everything back to default, so hopefully that sounds a little bit better. But I'll keep adjusting as I go through this session, and hopefully um, it'll make it somewhat better. So what does it sound like? Is it really like uh, distant and really low? Is it kind of hard to hear? You have to turn up your volume a lot? Hopefully that's a little bit better. Okay, good. We'll just go with that for now. And I'm also going to hear it later on after the recording and uh, see if there's anything else I can adjust on my end. Once I restart uh, the Twitch app, I'm actually using this um, kind of studio called the OBS, the OBS studio. Um, I'm still trying to figure out a lot of like the, the streaming processing of it. The video seems okay, but now I'm just kind of wondering about the audio now in the future. Um, We'll see. Maybe I have to next time try just going to off the audio directly off my camera too, and we'll see how that goes next time. Anyways, um, yeah. So, a question from New One Ninety Nine is about the differences between my mentorship at CGMA and Brainstorm, and um, some of the key differences between the two are going to be within uh, basically the setup of the platform because CGMA is a um, Ten week, no, I'm sorry, eight week course, and the brainstorm version is a uh, ten week. No, I'm sorry, no, twelve, twelve week course. So length of time is different between the two, the mentorships, and the mentorships are run also differently. Uh, where the the brainstorm version has uh, basically a one on one time session, an hour at least, minimally per person per week. Whereas the CGMA version, uh, everyone's together in one session of a room online, that is, and we deal with each other for a three hours amount of time, and I do feedback, one-on-ones, talks, uh, in that chunk of time in the week. So you're actually getting more time on the mentorship at Brainstorm, less with CGMA, but the price difference is, is because of that. So those are the key differences. Okay, so now that I have this kind of set up, uh, what I want to explain for this, I guess, first round, this first session, uh, first part before I jump into an actual sketch in my in my book is going to be always a lesson or even just a, a topic based off of one of the things in my class uh, and one of them is based on this idea of shape combination this idea of relationship within space and right now we have these five core forms uh, and these are the building blocks the the fundamental shapes that we use to construct everything that we see in observation so when we go draw on location, let's say you're with me uh, in class, we will go draw things like plants, uh, bugs, or animals, and cars, and tanks. Uh, we'd, we'd go draw many, many things. Um, sorry, that kind of blanked out real quickly. So will I have another dynamic sketching course on CGMA in the future? Uh, not right now at the moment. So the only place we'll be able to get it is through actual classes that I'll be teaching uh, online through my courses. Okay. Uh, beyond that though, so in terms of what's covering in this area, uh, it does, again, pertain to that class of CGMA. So option, thank you for that suggestion. I will definitely take a look at that. Um, I'm looking for more suggestions too. Let me write it down somewhere actually. <laughs> Stream elements. Okay. Cool, thank you. So let's just go through this one real quickly uh, based on the core forms that we have, five core shapes, and these are in three dimensions that we're playing with. Uh, and the idea is that how do we apply this, the combining of shapes, into observational drawing? Because this right here is all basically just playing with perspective, the relationship of space. Perspective is the idea of giving the optical illusion of three-dimensional objects on a two-dimensional plane. That's the point of perspective. 
So here I'm showing you things like vanishing line or um, basically lines that are going back receding to the horizon line, which gives you the vanishing points and gives you the impression of things going back in space. Objects can be in front of objects, foreshortening can happen as well too. And so those are the things that can actually you know, apply towards perspective work. Uh, so over here, beyond that, the idea of just only having a relationship within a space of things next to each other, we also want to show combinations of things. How do we put things together? So for instance, one example would be this. Uh, if I just showed to you uh, straight on, imagine if we have a box coming down, and then another box is being combined into this one. So they're being pressed into each other, right? And we can continue to press more boxes into each other. It's like Legos, essentially. We're just combining these shapes into each other. But there's a construction method. How do we construct the question? To find this accuracy of one shape into another. None of this stuff I'm going to talk about, I wouldn't expect all, any of you guys to automatically just understand. Uh, but these are just notes to share with you in terms of things I, I go into for my classes. Uh, so how that kind of works is imagine if we took that box again we drew it completely and from there let's draw the other box and let's just overlap it now with this impression the idea is that we basically have three things happening either one box is in front of the other left in front of right right in front of left or uh, they are combining together literally like the one we have up here so how do we find this combination of the placement of where these marks are happening? Uh, and this is where it's confusing for a lot of students when I show this inf information, but just real quickly, uh, the idea is that it's only going to happen within a certain area of space, which is obviously in the overlap area right there. This is the overlap, which is where the connection is going to be found. So you see this connection, I'm trying to find that within that space. So on this very line right here to here, which is a line nearest to me, nearest to the camera. I'm going to choose somewhere on that line just by choice. Uh, there's no direct answer as to which area you want to choose. It's all based on subject matter or you as choosing it. Let's just put one in the middle for the moment. I could put one near back or more to the right. doesn't really matter. Um, from there, I can place a line going down following this perspective and going back following that perspective line. And as we do so, if I kind of darken up the lines, we now have the two boxes being combined together within the same space, which is a real relationship between the two forms as they are interconnecting together. Okay? Now that's one thing, one box connecting into another. Uh, but we also want to be able to show more additional shapes. So if I keep adding additional forms into this thing, let's say I place in a pyramid over here, and again, I'm not really twisting and turning these dramatically, but if I place in this object and I'm trying to find that point of connection, again, it's only happening within the overlap. That's the overlap area. And the line nearest to the camera, which is a corner of this pyramid, on that line, just anywhere I want to choose on that line as a point, let's put it right there. I want to follow the perspective line of this one and the perspective line of that one as it goes back. Now this box has now been pressed and combined into the pyramid. So if I throw in some like hatching to show shadows, like for instance if this was in a shadow area, you start to see how these combined shapes are appearing. Uh, another difficult one would be to even consider now curvature. I mean let's say I took a box, again starting with a box is kind of the best idea uh, because it gives you a sense of perspective, it's easier to con generally construct, and it's kind of the typical shape that we approach with uh, for the exercise. But whatever shape you begin with is up to you. Uh, but I typically start with the square, this cube. From there, if I wanted to apply something more spherical, and that's what we placed in a sphere, like how do I combine this to this? Uh, trying to find these kinds of points within a rounded spherical form sounds very complex and it can be for many people and again I'm looking for the idea of overlap the overlap is in between this area here where the sphere and the box are next to each other so from there I want to find the line nearest to the camera which is this line of the corner of the box 
and I'll find the point. Just your choice. Let's put it right in the middle just to kind of keep it safe. At this point, what I have to do is follow. This is a top plane. This is a front plane. And each of these planes are in a perspective. And if you kind of imagine an ellipse sitting inside there, you have to take that ellipse and put it on the inside of the sphere. So imagine drawing through all the way inside the sphere, matching the perspective plane at the top and the perspective plane on the side. Then imagine this line, this line, wrapping around the sphere. Here's the corner of the box. Imagine if this was in shadow side, the front plane. That sphere has now been pressed into the box. So what's the point of all this? Like, why do we have to practice this in the first place? Like, is there an actual, you know, use of it at all? Well, let me just give you a really quick example of even like drawing something organic and how we can combine something of this uh, information technique into like observational drawing or more construction methods. So let's say I drew uh, something very organic like a fish and uh, we can start a fish with how about a line and that's going to be just giving me general length of proportion of the animal and then from there I can begin with how about um, I don't know the fish can be a cone head and then from that cone kind of head like form we can go into more of a longer cone like shape. Here's some cross contours and then back end is going to be the fins we have uh, different sorts of constructions of fins on top, dorsal fins, pectoral fins, um, all throughout the body of the shape of the form. So from there, I can even place in where the information of the eye is placed in. Now if I want to find the other end of it, all I have to do is draw through the thing, find a cylinder, and now I can combine these shapes together also. How the cone wraps around that cylinder giving you this three-dimensional information about how these shapes are being combined together. Here's the mouth construction to the gill. So now I've taken something organic, using very primitive geometric forms, combining shapes together. Here was a cylinder, the cone, how the cone wraps around that cylindrical form, rounding this way, rounding out that way. So this kind of shows you then the direct application, how we do shape combinations to organic things, and even mechanical stuff, or everyday objects that we look around us, the idea of how we can uh, apply and manipulate shapes by either cutting things away or adding stuff into it. Uh, it just gives us a lot more control of uh, that construction method. And the biggest thing to walk away from with this is the idea of how we draw through the sketch. So by drawing through, you're able to see the construction of the entire thing. We draw the entire form, not just partially, because we can assume what this is going to look like, and if you can see it, you would draw it. But for those of you that wouldn't know how to actually construct this stuff, then you would need to use some method to help you visualize it on the paper. So drawing through is an immensely uh, important aspect of being able to you know, control this part of it. Question from um, here to learn is, how did you learn hatching and cross-hatching, or cross-hatching? Did you just study other artists? Do you have uh, a method behind it? Can you um, recommend some good artists to study? Many. And so hatching is, is one of those things that is that honestly it could be an entire lecture on itself uh, because I have many resources that people that I look at. Um, you know, I also have a system in terms of how I practice. And uh, of course, you know, there are even certain tools that you should be even thinking about using uh, before you move into other certain tools. Um, just to kind of give you a scratching of the surface of like how we can do things like hatching methods kind of goes back to even just line control and line control is the origin in my opinion of being able to you know produce high-end hatching which seems obvious now when you hear it right um, 
So when you actually go into line control, the exercise that we do in the class is the idea of having a pen, and we use usually felt tip pens. Uh, and felt tip pens, what we do is we will place in things like horizontal lines of varying degrees of length, and we will control these lines as parallel as possible, even with the consideration of spacing in between. Okay, even spacing in between. Uh, to build mileage, what we will do is also draw the line and repeat the line several times over to control it. Repeat the line and then also increase control several times over. And this is more for line weight. But here I'm controlling spacing. The spacing in between each line. So that way I get these very even spaces as I produce each one. Okay. Now if I apply this to hatching, imagine if we took a bar and I just applied a one directional hatch into this. Let's set up another one. And we're just going to do one directional. Let's go a little bit dark in the beginning. Let's continue to space out the lines as it gradually shifts lighter in value. So spacing it out very properly is something that we should be able to do. Uh, even if it's something more complex, uh, changing of directions. The more I tighten up the actual hatching, the darker the value becomes. The more I begin to space things out, the lighter the value as it shifts down this gradual uh, change. So that's where I would practice our hatching methods, right? Uh, the succession of each line as it's being produced on uh, next to each other. So that's one of the methods in how we practice this uh, particular exercise. Um, again, we can vary the degrees of directions. There, are, There's even an actual uh, system that I follow in terms of how many directions you can go up to. Uh, and of course, the, the controlling of value. How dark you go, how light you're able to shift it, how gradient and soft and smooth that transition is also. So this is kind of like the beginning parts of how you would begin to start thinking about hatching. So. If you're going to hatch in the future, I would say first, you're going to want to really practice your line control. Uh, and from there, push it harder, okay? So this stream right now um, on Twitch, it is going to be saved for a couple of days. What I do is download it, and then I re-upload onto Twitch as a highlight. And I'll save out a section of it and so that people can watch certain parts. The entire uh, live stream will most likely post it somewhere else. Uh, I might do it on, either on my YouTube or, I don't know, I'm not sure exactly yet. I have them in storage right now. Uh, the very first episode, I don't have anymore. It disappeared half of Twitch because I didn't realize they deleted it. So, anyways. So, Ryan Villain asks about ellipses. You know, um, I'm having trouble drawing an elliptical plane inside of a sphere. Uh, and particularly getting a plane to be parallel to the face of a top or bottom face of a cube that sphere is in. Uh, can you show us how you would attack that? Um, Yeah, ballpoint it gives you much softer control. So right now, I also have a ballpoint pen like this one. So there's nothing wrong with using ballpoint pen. So if you wanted to do this exercise with a ballpoint pen also, uh, just go with the intention of, of um, commitment to the line. And so you can be softer about it, obviously, which is a big benefit of, of ballpoint. But the problem with ballpoint, as you start to hatch or render with it, is that you begin to feather. And when you feather, uh, you, you produce a lot more line than you really need to. So felted pen has a much thicker line work so that way you got to be much more in control of how many lines you're placing down. So one of the terms behind that is line economy. How many lines do you need to produce a certain shape or aesthetic, right? So if some people are drawing boxes, what do they do? They, they do this. They're trying to find that shape and they're trying to find the lines and making sure each direction is correct and they use all these lines just to find it instead of going in there and knocking it out with a couple of strokes with the confidence and commitment that you need behind it. Now both apply. There's nothing wrong with one or the other. I'm just saying be mindful of what you're actually doing. Control it because you intentionally did it, not because it's just because you're trying to search your way through it. Right? Um, in terms of the whole elliptical thing, Ellipses are, again, much like hatching another entire lecture on its own, and I can't go into the entire thing now. Uh, we don't have the time to because I'm going to move on to the sketch. Uh, but when it comes to ellipses, and, and they are very complex, um, it, it's, for one, 
here's a really simple thing to understand or, or I guess to get over and across that you all have to kind of like figure out. Um, if, even if we just drew a circle, okay? Take a box, we'll cross it off, and we'll throw a circle in there. And we can say that this is a symmetrical form, obviously, right? So if I flipped it in any direction, uh, it's 50-50. Okay, it's half each side. We, it's symmetrical, completely symmetrical. And even if I took an ellipse, of whatever degree, by flipping it vertically, horizontally, this is also 50-50. This is a symmetrical form. Um, <clears throat> yeah, for rendering aspects, ballpoint is where we apply that. So back when I was at Art Center, uh, we were all super into ballpoint because we would render the crap out of our drawings. Uh, but again, it has a time and a place. It's about choosing when you do something like that and when you don't. Uh, both are fantastic tools. It's about knowing how to control both of them. I will say, though, that if you do start with a felt tip pen, the reason why we begin with felt tip pen and not with a ballpoint, because if you were in my class, I don't allow ballpoints. Uh, and the reason why is because, again, it creates a lot of hesitation and feathering techniques. So I want you to commit to your lines and build up more confidence. If you can build more confidence and then come back to the ballpoint, you have much more control of that particular tool as well, too. Even when you go to the pencil, other tool sets, your line economy, but line control becomes far better. Uh, but that's just, again, part of my class. I'm not saying you have to do that. It's just if you were in my class, you would. Uh, in any case, with the ellipses, circles and ellipse, essentially what you get is a symmetrical form. But if I put this in perspective, let's say we put a plane in here, okay? And even a more extreme plane a perspective. These are all one point boxes. So if I put this in cross, here's center point. Let's throw an ellipse in there. Okay, this is a top plane or a bottom plane or whatever the plane is. Here's the dilemma of what we just did right now. We've already confirmed the fact that the ellipse from a plane that's a circle to an ellipse is symmetrical. Okay, and that's what makes it a true ellipse. Because if I did something like this, like a, a blobby form, or something teardropped, obviously that wouldn't work that way. It's not an ellipse, right? So if I did something like this in perspective, and if I threw an ellipse in there, what you are now getting is the front side and the back side that are not symmetrical. Okay? So you have this front section larger more in space than the one in the back. Now we can say that, but that's in perspective. It's supposed to be doing that. But that's not a true ellipse then, because we have a skewing of what's happening. So typically in perspective, what we t tend to do is that when we have a box and plane, and we cross it off, the question, the question really is about this. Where is true center of the ellipse? True center. True center. Okay? Because this is not true center then. Because over here, these ellipses are off because as we split this, um, it's not a symmetrical form. So that can't be true center. But if I brought that center down a little bit and then drew an ellipse inside there, what we would be doing is trying to find true center of that point. Okay? It's, again, very perplexing for many people. It doesn't really make sense. But beyond that, the other part of it is now about how we would take an ellipse and put it on a plane that's in perspective as well too, uh, going up and below the horizon line in perspective. So if I just drew an ellipse on the horizon line, it could be a circle. If I turned it in a degree, whatever the case is, it would be sitting right in the middle. Then you wouldn't really have a tilt of any type. Uh, but once we actually put, let's say, I'll put a vanish point over here, and let's put the front plane of the box over on this side. Let's have the vanishing point going that direction. From this vanishing point, as it comes out with a center line, this line right here, where it's coming out, would be called the minor. And this is the shortest distance, the shortest distance between two sides of the ellipse, okay? Then we have this line coming out from this direction, 
uh, which is this one here. This is what we call the major. And this is the longest distance between the two the ellipses, essentially. Okay, the longest distance and shortest distance, the minor and the major. So if I have the minor applied, which is coming from that vanishing point, from the center of this plane, that is the shortest distance between the two spaces. The major has to be 90 degree angles within that cross, 90, always. So if I throw in 90, that's going to be this diagonal here. Well, close to, it's more like this. This is major. It is the longest distance between the ellipse. So if I throw the ellipse in there now, you get something more like that. Now here's a mistake that people make, is that if I throw the box in there, again, here's another one below it, in perspective, people just tend to do this. And that's off, because it's not tilted. You've drawn this ellipse, which would be square on the horizon line, down over here. And that's a very common mistake that people will do when it comes to ellipses. And that is not correct as an ellipse. Because what you are now getting is more of, think of like a, a, a cigarette lighter. You're getting a, an oval, oval shape. Okay, where it should be more tilted. Because if I throw that back in perspective now, this is how true ellipses in perspective will look in a cylinder. Anyways, it's very confusing stuff. <laughs> Took me a very long time to figure that kind of stuff out too. But understanding the major and the minor, just this alone, can solve a lot of problems, okay? Uh, is first to understand that the shortest distance between the ellipse spacing is the minor. The longest distance between two points of the ellipse is the major. The, in, be, in that line, you have a 90 degree angle. So if you have it in perspective, you find the minor, which is going to go back into one vanishing point. Ne think of that as the axis of the wheels. And then the major is always 90 degree angles, 90, to that minor. This is just out of my, well, I've done it so much that, you know, it's out of my head now, so. I just choose random topics per session, and when somebody asks a question about something, I'll try to get into it. Again, like I said, this requires a lot more uh, demos and process, even to see it apply to something, uh, to make it more sense. But this is just to show you guys real quickly, because this is not a class. This is just to show you guys a bit of advice, <laughs> and people ask questions about things, and I try to answer a few things here and there. Uh, so it just kind of gives you an idea as to like what we tend to do in, this, in the classes that I teach. So here are some of the other notes, which is the idea of combining shapes, relationships, and forms together, uh, combining three-dimensional sh uh, shape language, then the idea of hatching emanates from line control, whether it's about line weight or spacing, then it's talking about ellipses afterwards. But anyways, for anybody that's just joined in now, that's kind of what we covered at the moment. Okay, um, I need to keep in... Oops, sorry keeping control of this camera because I don't want it to go to sleep. It's still currently on that mode, so I need to turn it off when I get the uh, stream offline. Anyways, uh, we're going to go to my sketchbook over here. I'm going to zoom out just slightly. And we're going to be sketching on this paper. And I'll be also answering questions for people that have uh, more curiosities of things. Uh, that's why I kind of do my live streams in the first place. It's just to um, talk, chat, and draw for you guys live. The first, usually like half an hour or more, is about an actual lesson or something. Uh, but now we can get kind of get into the idea of uh, just Q&A. And, and I'll be just drawing it in general. And of course, you are more than welcome to engage as much as you want to. Uh, for those of you who are just coming to watch, what I would suggest you do is draw, sketch with me, you know. And anybody that has more feedback uh, based on the video, based on, I, I know the audio is a little bit off right now, so I do apologize about that. Hopefully I'll get that all fixed up next time. But I know it's a little bit kind of probably quiet or low or distant at the moment, even though the mic is right next to me. Uh, but that might have to do with something internally right now with the camera or, or with the, um, the OBS studio. So the question I get <clears throat> from Krulex is, I have a hard time finishing my drawings uh, for years. You know, it's like, how do you, you know, what's your advice on something like that? It's like, when you guys ske start sketching something, you don't finish it, right? You just end to a certain point because you feel like it's not going in the right direction, and you stop, you go to something else. Uh, so what's my advice to that? You know, here, you know, NY Rock is saying, um, you know, just draw as much as you can. But the thing is, 
you know, drawing, just drawing it, we can say that, but it's not always the best solution for everybody because there, there are other things that have to be presented to you that gives you a better idea as to what to begin with. Um, maybe in the future, Tiger Mac, if you're in, uh, for someone who may you know, ask for something like that in the future, if we're asking about primitive shape techniques for figures, uh, I will do so next time. But for today, definitely not. So I'm going to start something here real quickly first. And I'm going to continue to answer the question about that. Um, so again, the question was like, how do I stick with that finishing? A lot of it has to do, for me, in my personal opinion, about clear intention about what it is that you were trying to sketch in the first place. Okay. Now, what do I mean by that? Intention. Uh, well, having a clear idea as to what the sketch is for. What is it for in the first place? Sketch, drawing, you know, rendered piece, I don't care what you're creating. What is it for? Um, if you can't answer that question and you have no clear idea as to what you're doing, then you're lost. And you got to sit down and really think about what it is you want to do. Um, so, you know, what are some intentions of sketching or drawing you could be doing? Well, one intention could be study. I'm just sketching to study. You know, there's no other intention behind that. It's just me uh, looking at objects, looking at other people's work, and I'm just trying to understand it. So the intention is very clear. You're trying to understand it. You're not trying to render it. You're not trying to finish it. You're not trying to finalize it. That question of even what finish is then comes up. Uh, so you could say that a study of a drawing, let's say I looked at this fish again. This right here was a study of a fish to show you how I combine shapes. That is a finished drawing. Now some of you might say, but it's not rendered. It's not realistic. You didn't go into the surfacing. You didn't detail more of it. But that was never my intention. My intention was to show you how I combine these things together. So as I did that, that I'm done because there's nothing else I intended to do with this. So when you start your drawings, have more of a clear idea as to what that drawing is for. If you do so and give yourself a general plan and strategy, uh, you might be able to get that finish as to whatever you kind of intend to be, uh, potentially more hit, uh, more consistently hit. Because when you just start drawing randomly and you're kind of lost a little bit, you'll just sit there um, just trying to sketch all the way through and not really having an idea. You get, you know, hours will pass by and the time can you just move and you get tired. Uh, and it doesn't really even come out the way you wanted to because you didn't even know what you wanted. So it's a very frustrating process if you don't really have that. So my recommendation is definitely really think about more on how you control your direction. <clears throat> So another question I have over here is uh, how to render metal with pen. Uh, well, with something like that, we do a lot of photo reference studies. Okay, so we will look at images, references, and even looking at real things. And you would study those. And using things like ink washes or even just using hatching techniques. But everything is based on value, how you control dark and lights and whatnot. But that takes, again, a large amount of practice to do so. Couple other questions. Uh, do you have any favorite recommended artistic media influences? Not necessarily a favorite. Uh, things that are recommended, you know, honestly, anything that piques your interest. Uh, for me, it's not even just, you know, artistic uh, in general. Sorry. There we go. Uh, it's not just artistic. It can also be based on things like um, documentaries. So videos of, I would watch about animals or nature or science, uh, how things work, I'm very much interested in history. So those are definitely parts of what I would actually really get into. Um, I, I love watching something but also getting information behind it. So of course reading books is another part of it too. Um, but they're all kind of connected together for me. Beyond that though, entertainment, you know, I still play games. I'll still watch a lot of movies. Um, those are all very much aspects of the things I'm interested in. Uh, what do you think is an efficient way to study perspective? Well, start from the very basics, you know, and, and of course there are many resources out there, books, videos, whatnot, and, you know, for some people that need videos in, in whatever the case is, I would definitely recommend um, Marshall. You know, I'm sure a lot of you guys know Marshall Vandruff, you know, uh, when you guys watch from Proco or something like that, and they do a lot of these podcasts now, and Marshall, you know, I've listened to lecture him, you know, from him lecture quite a bit, uh, and he has an excellent one on perspective, and on his website, if you go on there, uh, you will find a series of videos on basics of perspective, actually. They're kind of old. Actually, they're very old. But still, his explanation of how he does it is actually fantastic. 
So here's one I would also recommend highly. Uh, let's see. Question from MuseCube is shapes and forms confuse me. I can't put shapes and forms together to make a drawing disc. Uh, they disconnect somewhere. Well, a lot of that again is you gotta have someone to kind of show you on hand. So you just simply say whatever you're drawing, you know, make them into primitive forms. I mean, it makes sense in terms of like me explaining that and saying it to you, but in terms of like you actually applying it, you would have no idea where to begin, you know? So in that situation, you gotta have some sort of avenue, uh, whether it's an online course or uh, an actual physical location, something that you can go to. Uh, that will help you understand like what it is that what we're talking about right um so can you do it by yourself still i mean yeah if you go through a lot of lessons of videos and books and watching stuff like this it might give you an inkling of it but it won't necessarily give you the right tools to develop to make it your own thing and at the end of the day what you need to be able to do is make this your process uh make this a tool that you're going to be able to use going into the future but um, anyways in that situation look for some outlets uh, for ballpoint rendering, do you know a better way to get something up to the right value while keeping everything smooth? It takes like hours and run over shapes layer by layer. Well, that's the thing about ballpoint. It's much like um, graphite pencil renderings, right? You got to build up the layers, so it does take forever, uh, and, and there's no sim there's no shortcut, honestly, to it. Other than maybe like more time, where you can get so efficient, you know exactly what you want, then maybe. But in most people who begin with it, need a lot of time. So what I'm drawing right now is uh, the Tin Man. For some reason, I had this pop into my head, you know, Oz and you know the Wizard of Oz movie, and of course the storylines and the books and uh, the character of the Tin Man popping up. I think it's because I was thinking about Nutcrackers as I was drawing uh, certain, you know, holiday themed characters earlier, kind of the other day, and for some reason the Nutcracker led into the, to the Tin Man, and I kind of researched them a little bit, and now I wanted to sketch them. I had not seen Kirby Rosanis, or Rosanis, I think that's his name, his pieces. I'll look him up later on though. Uh, I'll look back on this stream and write down a bit of information from people's suggestions and also um, advices on things. So this Tim Man is going to be sitting in the grass. Uh, he's going to be like, he's going to be frozen solid from rust. Which incidentally, tin does not rust. So maybe he'll have like a tin surfacing with like a steel underlay. And thank you guys for kind of supporting each other for comments and suggestions. It really helps me along to be able to answer questions and things. Especially if I miss something, I do apologize. Sometimes the questions pop up uh, and I don't always um, catch them. So if you guys can help each other also, it can be great. This question from Coolex is, uh, you hate traditional and love digital are you a hack not necessarily uh would i recommend starting with analog and traditional methods highly absolutely now does that mean that because you started with digital that makes you a fake in any way no of course not digital is just another medium it's just another tool uh, but the problem is certain tools create bad habits and digital does create bad habits as well and the, the lessons that you'll learn on the digital side don't always migrate uh, to the analog side, the traditional side. However, a lot of the traditional methods do migrate to digital in terms of form of thinking, processes, techniques, uh, but a lot of the digital techniques do not. Now, can you learn things like value, color, all that kind of stuff uh, and whatnot to digital? Yeah, of course you can. Uh, but like I said, there are certain things you'll miss out on that I think can be very beneficial by using traditional methods. If you don't know what those things are, then you can ask. But in any case, that's the answer to that. Thank you, uh, Sergio. What kind of stuff am I working on now? Uh, actually, I'm working on the next process book, the next educational uh, notebook, which is the Dynamic Bible Extension. 
Uh, that particular book, I'm trying to get back in stock early next year. Everyone's been asking, trying to get a copy of it. Uh, I don't really have any in stock anymore, which is the big problem. Uh, I'm trying to get them printed for early January, February of next year. And uh, hopefully I'll have them more in stock. But I'm planning to actually produce the next book, which is going to go into more specific details of those notes. Because the complaint or the feedback I got from the first book was that it was very general. You know, in terms of like the topic and the, uh, the techniques and whatnot. And I designed it that way. So that way now I have an opportunity to go in much deeper uh, into the specifics behind it. A uh, question from Wufa Art is, what makes good shapes good? Well, I think a lot of it is, well, it can be divided into two things. Uh, storytelling and aesthetic. Aesthetically pleasing shape can mean something. And it also adds then to the storytelling. Like a shape can say something instinctually or emotionally. Much like how color we can respond to. Shapes we respond to also. Yeah, control Z, join traditional. Very bad habit. <laughs> but again, that's, you know, like I said, some younger people who begin their art training, because of the advent of digital being such a common place now, uh, you begin with that. You know, like when I started drawing, you know, we just used pen and pencils. We, I didn't get introduced to digital stuff until high school when I was like 18, 19, but this is back in like 98, you know. But we only just played with it. It was never really fully... You know, implemented into the process of things. People were still fighting it, if anything else. God damn it, sorry. I have to keep coming back to the camera because it shuts off. I will definitely fix that for next time. And for those of you that are just joining, um, there was a whole bit of a mess in the beginning, just trying to set up the new... Um, rig and everything. I'm using a camcorder, I'm using a new mic, and it's a little bit twitchy at the moment, but like I said, we'll get it solved. <clears throat> Commenters, I used to love to draw and drew almost every single day, but now I seem to not like it anymore. I can't even finish drawing because I tend to hate it as I go further. This is not a problem of technical, this is a problem of mental, you know, just how you f mentally think about the process of drawing. But it's also about, you know, um, how it looks personally to you and things that you are seeing that, you know, quite honestly, most people wouldn't. Um, it wasn't doing that last time because I was using a phone. So I'm using a, a Sony camcorder right now, so it's on a, a power save mode. I thought I turned it off, but it's still doing that. So I have to... Um, turn that off at some point when I get off the uh, stream because I don't want to go through fumbling this right now because it's going to be too distracting and people won't like it so I just have to go in there and just uh, make sure it doesn't go to sleep so I have to check back like, every couple minutes um, but anyways you know in terms of like that comment I understand what you're saying Sir Gerald you know, it's a very common thing and you have, to, you have to understand one aspect is that the way you feel is normal okay everyone feels that at some point every professional artist at some point has felt that too you know, it's like, what you're doing you don't like. You know, everything you put on the page, it doesn't come out the way you want it to. And it's a frustrating process because you put effort into it and it doesn't really feel like it's giving any dividends. You know, you're not growing, you don't seem to move forward, and it's just a struggle each time. And you have to go through this whole mental, you know, buildup to know that you're going to be going through stress, essentially. <laughs> and to be honest with you, how drawing should be is not stressful. Drawing should not create, you know, this anxiety where a lot of people actually do have now. And um, I understand it, but I don't necessarily go through it myself. Drawing for me is an extremely entertaining thing, and I'm highly rewarded by it. Now, people will say it's because you're so good now. Well, I don't also believe that I'm the best. I, there are people out there that are far better than me, but that doesn't detract from the fact that I enjoy it immensely. And granted, of course, I have you know many, many decades putting into this thing. Now the question is how much time have you put into it too? And you could say, but I put years and years myself into this. Yeah, I can't argue with that. Uh, and people, one common answer, as many instructors will tell you, is you gotta have more time. Well, I don't think that's the best answer for everybody either, because anybody can just say do more time. But I think a lot of it is also making sure the way you think of uh, your work is a reflection on yourself. You know, uh, how you think about you, and being able to just enjoy the moment instead of having to overthink it. 
Now, I'm not saying that you have to change it overnight and who you are right now is you're not going to be able to, you know, make it. And you can. You have all the potential and, and all the um, opportunity opportunities to be able to do this. But for me, you know, a lot of it is, is making sure that the mindset alters. How you see this is not about per performing something to make it look as beautiful as possible to let other people uh, look at you and be like, wow, look at this person who is doing something amazing. Everybody wants some sort of recognition, of course. I understand that. But at the same time, even if nobody was looking at it, you know, if it was just for you, to be able to say that you're okay with this, you know, like I'm, I actually like what I'm doing. I think that's really hard to overcome for many people. And that's something they that just kind of strive for. That's where you have to spend a lot of your time focusing on. Is that, yeah, you can focus on technique forever, but technique's not going to be the only answer. Technique only takes you, takes you so far. And you really have to just enjoy what you're doing in the process of it. And so that we are able to consistently and be disciplined about working on it for decades to come. And that technique will only just grow better as you age as well, too. But the deeper you go into this trap of like uh, very self deprecating thoughts about your work, and being like, it's not good enough, or I'm not very good anymore. It's like, I hate this, I hate that. Um, it, it'll not only reflect on your work, but it'll reflect on the way you communicate about your work. It'll reflect on your social aspect of life. Uh, and of course, how you communicate to others. So if you're working in the industry, and you come in with that kind of mindset, people don't want to work with that kind of mindset. People want someone who's confident. People want someone who knows what they're doing. And if you show any sign of like, this is not something I want to do, or I'm not really enjoying this. They don't want that kind of energy also. So what that means is you have to actually spend a good amount of time also in your youth to really figure out what it is and why it is you're doing what you're doing. So this is not easy stuff. This is all really incredibly hard to overcome. Uh, and there is no direct answer. There's no nothing I could tell you that says this is the way to do it. I am just saying the difficulty is there for everybody. And so what you're going through is very normal. So you don't have to necessarily think that you're the only one that's kind of suffering. Um, and because of that, that unity in the community of it should make you feel better because you should be able to work with other people now too, you know? Um, and that's the only way to move forward also as well in terms of advice as to how do I overcome this really now? I would say you got to work with others. Find like-minded people as much as you can. Uh, and for me, drawing with others, having a lot of friends that were all wanting, wanting to do what we wanted to do, helped each other get past certain points and grow. Uh, and that way I was able to maintain this consistency and eventually falling in you know, obsession and love with the thing I'm doing. Where I already kind of had that to some degree, but it only strengthened through the you know working with others. So, uh, but I, I know how tiring that can definitely be. It puts a lot of stress and strain mentally, uh, physically as well too, and emotionally. And so not everybody can do this. And that's why the most common people, the layman can't understand the, the, the difficulty of this sort of lifestyle uh, where you're just trying to create, you know? And people think it's like, oh, you just, you know, practice and put that time into it and you'll get better. But that's just a part of the equation, you know. Sorry if I missed a bunch of questions on there. But um, Wolf of Art asks, have I seen Spider-Verse? I have. And I loved it. It was great. Uh, let's see. I think there were a couple others here. Here to Learn asks, how lightly is your grip to the felt tip pens? I find that after a while the nib tends to wear down and becomes awkward to draw. You're, you're pressing too hard. And it's not about just pressure, okay? When it comes to the pen, the idea behind this is grip. The tighter you grip your pen, if you get white knuckles, then you gotta relax your grip. For me, my pen is resting on my middle finger and my index finger and thumb are curling the sides and I'm squeezing at the sides of it. Naturally, you're gonna get some pressure as where it's sitting on top of it, okay? Um, but if you're pressing way too hard, it's because you're gripping way too hard. So relax your grip and think about the distance between the pen as well too. When I begin to sketch, I hold the pen at a further distance because it creates less leverage and more of this uh, sense of gesture. If I go close to the edge of the nib, I'm going to squeeze harder and press harder too. So I'm always moving at distances of the pen. Right now you'll notice I'm drawing more at a distance like this, so I don't want to press too hard. And I appreciate you guys uh, stopping by and asking questions. So, all right, let's continue on with the uh, Tin Man here. So 
So we have a lot of great comments. And I'm just kind of reading a few of the comments on the chat board right now. And uh, it's great to have you guys share your personal um, experiences and whatnot. So as much as you would you know, potentially learn from me, you guys can actually very much potentially learn from each other. So the idea is that everyone has their own perspectives. And as an instructor, even though I teach a certain method, the reason why I enjoy it so much is that everyone's perspective is different. And so how they see it and how they use it and manipulate it is their own. And that in turn helps me understand how I can also approach it differently. So I learn just as much as I teach. Uh, and that's why I also agree that when it comes to teaching, uh, it's not about just looking above, but it's looking laterally next to you. So when people are looking for answers by going to like pros and people in books and old masters, and those are all great methods of learning. But like I said, looking right next to you is really important. Who are you moving with? Is there anyone else around you? If not, it really stifles your growth. Because to maintain that energy and discipline by yourself is incredibly hard mentally. And you don't always want to just turn online because people online... Uh, again, I'm sure you understand. <laughs> there can be a lot of negativity in terms of people's mindset and such. Not because you know they're, they're trying to be, it's just the name of the game and in terms of this field of, of working in, in art. It just kind of comes with the territory a little bit. shut off so I will be potentially uh, doing two streams a week from now on so for people that actually want to come watch more um, please do so but my intention is to do more streams uh, mainly because I felt like one a week was not enough to kind of keep people aware of what's going on you know attention spans are short these days and uh, online growth requires more consistency so I'm gonna be doing two from now on. Uh, more than likely, I'll keep the same schedule having it Thursday uh, evenings in Pacific time, but I'll also probably do one on Mondays. So Monday and Thursdays is when my options will be. I will be doing a watercolor on this as well. So let me move this a bit more. Uh, currently what I'm working on is my next book, the next Dynamic Bible. I'm also working on setting up all my schedule for traveling for next year. So I will be going to quite a few places internationally. How do I like, like stream, uh, streaming on Twitch? Um, compared to Instagram, yeah. I mean, the benefit of Instagram was that it already has uh, obviously a large you know, number of followers on there that you know, know when I'm doing certain things, so they're able to just kind of jump in. So that, there's that huge benefit of having you know, a good amount of people on there to interact with. But to be honest with you, even if it was 10 people, it's still fun for me because even if I'm just interacting with a few, it's more than enough. So the change of the platform was not really much of an issue in terms of numbers of people, uh, but definitely in the fact that Instagram eventually kind of showed me that quality wasn't very good. I didn't like the format in terms of the orientation of the video. It wasn't, you know, salvageable as content to use again, so I had to look for some other route. Uh, I played with stuff a little bit about a year ago, you know, things like on YouTube or, you know, I've opened up a Patreon account, and Twitch. I, I thought about I had opened the account as well too, but at that time, this was a while back, uh, they didn't have the mobile app on there, and I didn't have any camera set up at that point either, uh, so I couldn't just jump in, and that was the idea. Was I needed something a bit more user friendly as well, because. You know, technically I can you know solve things out, but it takes time, and I don't have all the time in the world to do so. Can you share art? In what way? So, question from New York Rock is uh, help on gesture versus structure. So uh, we were reading from Houston, and he says to alternate between them, but when I focus on one, I end up losing the other. So I'll give you guys even a quick technique uh, a demo on this. The 
concept of gesture and structure. Now, do keep in mind, anything I'm talking about um, is not the answer. Okay, I'm not saying this is the way it has to be. These are things that I have found over experience uh, through lessons of, of other instructors and time and place, all that kind of stuff. So again, this is a combination of things that I've picked up over time, but this is not the only way to do it, and nor is this the only way to communicate it. There are many other people out there that probably can communicate it better than me. Um, so I'm not saying I'm also right either. There are some things that I might be communicating in a way that many people might not agree with. Regardless of that, uh, this is what it works for me. Okay, so at the end of the day, for a lot of you guys who are learning from many other instructors or books or formats, is that you have to be the one to make decisions as to what works for you and pick and choose the things that really add to your techniques and lessons and methods or whatever the case is. But you gotta try them all, okay? So we can easily convey gesture as something based on feeling, movement, okay? I'm trying to capture a sense of energy, rawness behind it. You know, a certain artist I would say recommend is looking at a guy named Heinrich Klei, or Klei, as people say. Heinrich Klei is a, a German artist from like the early 1900s, or late 1800s, early 1900s, and he had this amazing gestural line behind the sketches, captured a lot of movement. That's one of the key things is movement in the line that captures movement in the figure or the form. Then there's structure, which is, you know, having a very systematic approach to how you build things to give it a sense of solid, you know, um, internal shapes to a, a method of layer as you are building up to more information. So gesture and structure kind of have this contrasting between the natural sense of like, you know, even elements, right? Water versus nature, like uh, water versus rocks or, or um, terrain. <clears throat> if we apply this to drawing, like for instance, if I was uh, even drawing an animal of some type, you know, we can go with structure because this is what pe people typically know me for. And, and you know, uh, NY Rock is kind of saying that is that my stuff is very construction heavy. So you know, how would I actually approach something with more gesture? For instance, if I approached uh, an insect of some type, I think I did an insect like this last time. Let's say it's like a stag beetle. And I can show you the shapes that it takes to build this thing. And of course it has, you know, as an insect, six legs, in terms of all the anatomical details, the kind of forms that I would use to convey each section. And I'm drawing through each form, getting through every section and piece. So this can be a more constructive method, obviously. But can I approach this also very gesturally? Yeah, I could. And here's one of the uh, techniques that I teach in the class uh, at Art Center, or even at other classes that I have in the dynamic sketching approach, uh, which is to convey a sense of movement. And what I'm looking for is a, sponta uh, a spontaneity of decision making. So for instance, as I draw, here's, a, here's the, what we call the one line drawing. And this is done by many artists, this one line technique. And so we'll start the drawing and I'll move and I won't stop. The idea is that you don't stop until the drawing is complete. So I gotta be able to crisscross back and forth between lines to be able to get to where I need to. Now that doesn't mean that one technique is better than the other. It just means that one is showing a different expression than the other. Both of them have strengths. One is very structural to show you three dimensions of the form. The other is very gestural movement, which captures a lot of energy and spontaneity of line. Lines that I would not consciously make. Lines that I'm having to produce because I just need to move in certain directions. But if I combine the two together, if I can start something that has construction, to give myself a good general idea of perspective, and then bring in something that is gestural in areas, to do line work that I wouldn't normally do to create energy and flow and movement on top of each other. 
you can bring a balance between the two potentially and so there are many artists out there that I also feel like do things really well in this way um, one of the artists classic artists you might want to look at is um, Charles Dana Gibson who is very famous for a series called the Gibson girls and I believe he actually balances his uh, line work of structure and gesture really really work uh, well uh, because if you look at Gibson's work he does these amazingly constructed plano heads of women but the hair is very gestural very movement based uh, it's really incredible and as you guys are talking about Elisa you know uh, Ivanova's work who you know I think is also uh, currently at the moment right now one of the best draftsmen in the world uh, her aesthetic control of line and also her ability to be able to balance construction and also gesture is someone who I believe is, is at a very high-end level, you know? And so I would agree, looking at someone like her would be probably very inspirational. And I love her work a lot. I actually own one of her originals, so. It's great to talk to her every time I see her at shows. Anyways, that's a quick lesson on gesture and structure. I hope that made sense. Sometimes I talk about things and it makes sense to me, but I don't, always quite know, quite know if it makes sense to others. These days, I don't really buy uh, prints and books anymore. I tend to buy originals only. So any artists that I f am fond of, friends, also I can support, uh, people I've always wanted to collect from these days, currently, I usually tend to save my money to buy uh, original pieces. I have this original from Jeff Darrow, a comic artist. If you guys don't know who Jeff Darrow is, look him up. Jeff Darrow was an amazing comic artist who's still around, did the uh, Shaolin Cowboy series, and I bought an original from him couple hundred dollars. It was a, a large like piece. It was incredible withdrawn. I still need to frame that. <clears throat> Homeworld art book. Nope. I do not. I will look that up as to what that is. Jeff Darrow worked on an amazing comic called Hard Boiled, which is the one I was introduced to when I was a kid. Or not a kid, younger. Um, he was known for a lot of his concept artwork for The Matrix back in the 90s. But his comic series stuff, Hard Boiled, was one of his mo most notable ones. And he did another one called uh, Big Guy really amazing series as well too and then recently he's been doing the uh, Shaolin Cowboy Jeff Darrow's work I'd always see at Comic Con in San Diego and uh, again I've always loved his work the level of intricacy and detail is mind-numbingly heavy <laughs> to the point where some people probably don't really like it so much because it's too detailed but I really loved it as a younger person and I would try to imitate that like crazy Oh, you can't beat originals. Absolutely. There's something, you know, with the texture, the tactileness, the materials, being able to see it, uh, that you just can't capture on the digital side, obviously. And that's the whole, you know, point of the difference between the two. That doesn't mean that art, digital art can't be uh, valued either. I, I feel that it can be. So most people won't agree with that. But definitely between the two, I would always, you know, want the traditional. I am going to bring in some watercolor into this. I'm going to be using my Shink brand watercolor. Oh yeah, yeah. It was uh, Frank Miller and um, Jeff Darrow come together for that one. I'm amazed a movie or a series of some type has not been optioned for that particular uh, book. It's such an amazing um, IP. It's a crazy story. but. <laughs> The War of Art. I have to look that up.
So here we have a rusted Tin Man. I actually did a Tin Man earlier yesterday, but I wasn't very fond of it. I finished it, and I liked doing it, but at the end of it, it's not because I didn't like the, the way the drawing turned out. It was just more based on the design of it, which I wasn't super fond of. It wasn't necessarily exactly what I was kind of imagining. Not that I had a very clear picture either, but I, I wanted a certain feeling from it, which was a sense of like, I don't know, what's the right word for that would be? Not charming. Something endearing, maybe? Something softer? Because the one I had done before was kind of aggressive looking, <laughs> kind of scary. I thought it didn't really match up to the story type that I wanted to go for. So usually when I tend to have drawings, and, and drawings that I've, I tend to favor or not favor, are based on now feeling, not, not on technique so much. Uh, you know, does the feeling convey as to what I thought would be, you know, be kind of close to? This one is definitely much close to what I'm going for. The only other language I can remotely speak, which is very basic and primitive at its level, is Korean. Because um, my uh, ethnic background is Korean. Parents immigrated over to the U.S. back in the late 1970s. I was born in the U.S. in the 80s. Uh, but I grew up in, in a, you know, kind of a town where not a lot of Asian people are around. So I was born in Colorado. Uh, my dad joined the U.S. military back in the 70s. And I was born in 81 on the Army base in, in Colorado Springs, Fort Carson, where I was born. And uh, we, we moved to Ohio, Columbus, Ohio. And my dad got a job in Honda at the production line of Honda cars, painting them. So he had a very kind of you know, manual, manual labor job. Um, my mom cut hair, so she was a hairstylist. She owned her own little shop. And that was it, you know, that was our lives. Um, so, you know, around that time, you know, back in like the late 80s, early 90s and stuff like that, and, you know, like I said, I, w I wasn't around a lot of Asian people. So, I didn't really have the time or the opportunity to use the language. The only time I used it was with my parents. And when I was a, y a kid, Korean was the language that I would typically go for, but that was just being a toddler. It was basic words, you know. Uh, so I never really had the opportunity to really push conversational Korean, which I can do remotely, very primitively, like I said. And it's very casual. And when it's very official, it can be a little bit hard. And I know the actual language in terms of structure, uh, you know, how to, how to even read it too, very basically. The problem is I've forgotten much of the vocabulary. So I don't know what certain words are in terms of you know what I'm trying to say them, um, but I would know how to how to lay it out in terms of the phrase behind it, you know. And the, and the problem with Korean, much like in Japanese, is that the Western you know language has kind of crept in to the, uh, the the language in Korean as well too. So they use a lot of English words for for things of description, and so when they say that, I'm expecting to hear a Korean word. But they're telling it to me in English, but in a Korean accent. So I don't understand what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> that's very interesting, Ryan. Nick was his name. And that's funny because the actual name of the Tin Man is Nick when he was a human. I think his name was like Nick Chopper. His story is very uh, grisly in the uh, story of Oz. So we're almost done here at this point in terms of the drawing. I wanted to make it more of a, a softer scene. There wasn't much I wanted to push too much on. Um, I just wanted to make it seem like a moment of kind of stumbling across the Tin Man in the field where he's been rusted shut. some watercolor. I'm going to be using these uh, water brush pens, or just water brushes, that is. And 
let's start to go into that. Well, it's not really much of a story. This is a character uh, from the world of Oz who was the Tin Man. And the Tin Man was uh, the human that was turned into, well, not really turned into, he was eventually converted over to being a mechanical man, essentially. And in the Alice in Wonderland story, we see him uh, encountered by Alice, not Alice, I'm sorry, not Alice in Wonderland, <laughs> Wizard of Oz. Uh, I've got my sto stories mixed up there. Dorothy comes across the Tin Man. Some brands of sketchbooks that I would recommend. One, the specific sketchbook that we use in my classes is uh, from a company called Cottonwood Arts. So how you would spell that. And I'm sure some of you guys have heard of them before. Uh, but look up Cottonwood Arts sketchbooks. Oh yeah, I am making a book, but that's separate. This is nothing to do with that. Uh, the book I am making is a collection of lecture notes from lessons of my classes, the dynamic sketching approach. Thanks for the suggestion, Ryan. I'll try to figure out how to do that. <laughs> I feel very old sometimes about new technology and platforms. Not to say it's not hard to figure out. Obviously, I'll figure it out. But as soon as you kind of begin, you're like, ah, uh, you lost and I don't know what you're doing. I'm just kind of going in there and saturating it with a temperature. Kind of imagining this where it's like a sunset, so the color is going to be much more the yellows and oranges and reds with a little bit of cool in the shadows. The background will be more pink and purplish. So I'm just kind of laying down a temperature of color right now. Washes. When it comes to watercolor, just washes. Uh, well, I sell my book on Amazon. If you're talking about the Dynamic Bible, uh, the current one at the moment it is not on Amazon because to sell on Amazon you have to have it in their storage compartments which costs a lot of money uh, and I'm not a big publishing house or corporation I've been just kind of doing everything self-publishing by myself I have a storage facility and a printer in Korea uh, which I sell the books out of my own storefront on Shopify but currently I'm out of stock of that current book but the next book will be published by Super Ronnie and so that next book will potentially be on Amazon because it'll be a much larger distribution. So the next one, um, okay, so imagine this. The, the first one that I put down essentially carries a lot of the very general notes that I cover in my class, but they're very general. Okay, It gives you good information on all the topics, but it's only a few pages per section. Uh, the new one f only focuses on two or three subject matters based on what we do in the class. We, we look at something in observation, organic things, mechanical things, and we draw them uh, at a very not a primitive level, but in a level that helps us retain the information to build this really strong sense of visual library. That is the point of the class. Um, and so the next book goes more specifically into two subject matters. Uh, the beginning of the book will always actually will have a more detailed note on exercises and practices, uh, things like the ellipses and things like the line work and the hatching, all that kind of stuff, and the basic rendering techniques uh, will be covered in each of those books. But the specific subject we've broken down with a lot more information and density and so that's kind of what the next dynamic bible will do and the next 
uh, the book of it, the two subjects that I'm focusing on will be one on organic and one on mechanical. So it would potentially be on like one, let's say like a vehicle form like cars, another one will be like on organics, so like insects or something like that, right? So the entire book will be focused on just those two subjects, uh, but with more specific breakdown. That's the idea. Uh, did I study comic artists to learn inking with felt tip pens? Not really. No. I looked at a lot of um, American illustrators and also European illustrators. Back from like the early 1800s to 1900s, um, looking at their illustration styling. Some comic artists, you know, who would do like, covers and stuff, I would look at. Uh, a lot of fantasy artists as well, too. Guys like Frank Miller. Not Frank Miller, I'm sorry. Uh, um, Frank Frazetta. So have I worked with Kim Jong-gi before? Um, in terms of like that question, like how, what degree? I wouldn't really say that we've worked together. Uh, we've had many conversations, we've hung out, and you know, every time he's in town, we, sorry, camera's off. Uh, we would get together. But um, in terms of actually working on a project together, not yet. But the book I will be producing will be done through their publishing house. But um, next year at Comic Con in San Diego, I will be sitting next to him. So we'll all have uh, one big booth. Yeah, I was hanging out there at Comic Con for this year. But for next year, I'll actually be at that table solely. So Jay, in terms of answering that question, in, in my recommendation, it could, yes, it could. Because the first one gives you a lot of the very um, general information, the coverage of overall things. Um, and the volumes that come out next, I'll be doing series of them. You can pick and choose the one you want, because I'll cover many different subject matters. But uh, the first one definitely will give you the more broad, overall idea of the class and the format. Which is what I wanted in the first place. But that was also, again, one of the, the feedbacks I got was that they wished there was more information per subject. But I very much did that purposefully. On the uh, front page of the Twitch, or per video. Yeah, I think I have to edit that. I thought I did already, but I typed this whole thing in terms of like what the description was about, but but I'll look into it again. The front page one, okay. And yeah, thanks for the feedback on that. And that's also what I typed in on the OBS stream information. I typed that in actually. Uh, let me see if I just clicked on update information if it'll do it. But but I can see that on the uh, live stream. I also have. Twitch open right now. It doesn't it hasn't updated it that way. So yeah, there's a lot of miscommunication happening between the actual streaming program and actual Twitch. So, so this is the first time using this ever, the camcorder with OBS. So I just kinda of fired it up and just I had a moment of even just like trying to figure out how to connect the camcorder to it. There's something with the resolution that to solve out first before it started reading it through the chip in the card. Anyways, we'll get there. This one was definitely a little bit of a, a test run for me with a new system. The last couple ones I thought were great, but 
in my personal opinion, I thought the videos were very low quality in my, in my thoughts. Uh, they were very um, pixelated. Even though they were like 720p off the phone, when I replayed them, it looked really choppy to me. So I didn't like it. That's one of the things that will also detract me from certain platforms. Like if it's kind of hard to figure out, uh, if it takes too much time to set up, it's like, ah, I don't want to really do it. Um, you know, I've come to the point of like, we want to plug and play kind of thing. But granted, obviously I understand that production values need to go up with more time investment and, and research. But I'm just one person, you know? So uh, I only have so much time to sit there and research everything, which I kind of had to for this, honestly, so. In terms of how my life is so far, it's fantastic. I have absolutely no complaints. Um, doing everything I've always just wanted to do, which is create for myself and you know, uh, work with people, feel absolutely confident in the things that I'm doing. Not necessarily saying I'm the best, but completely happy with what I am producing. Um, can there be things that could always be better? Sure, absolutely, absolutely. Um, but that doesn't mean that you know it, it doesn't break my absolute level of drive and interest in the things I want to do. You know, certain projects we put out there or things that we produce could always be better in quality. Or I wish I made more money here or that kind of thing. And, you know, financial security is always nice to have. But at the same time, it's not the main priority and the goal. It's just one of those outcomes. Eventually, hopefully, it'll get better over time. You know, but be able to travel the world and talk with people and have actual people even interested at all. There's n nothing else you could, you know, really ask for, honestly. Anybody who's out there, at the end of the day, if you're, you know, having the ability to just control the things you want to do and people are willing to just listen and engage and talk to you, then, you know, I think that's, you're in a good spot. And for me, it's, you know, I'm happy just with that. Any particular visual inspirations from film or cinemas that I like? Well, of course, I would definitely start with some of the classics. Uh, you know, studies on Akira Kurosawa is highly recommended, and I'm sure a lot of you guys are very aware uh, of uh, Kurosawa's films. If you have not watched a lot of Kurosawa films, I would recommend it highly. Uh, the first time I watched a Kurosawa film was in high school when I was like 15, 16 years old. Um, obviously, a late introduction to some degree for some people, but I thought that was you know, soon enough. And uh, I watched Yojimbo for the first time at a film study class in my high school, actually. And it was a kind of a study on you know, just films in general. And the the teacher was a really big into films and cinema and also that director kind of introduced it to us. It's amazing. And then I watched the whole series of his stuff afterwards, but he he's definitely a master class in, in, you know, directing and editing and character and story and cinematography, all that stuff, but he kind of handled everything, you know. And he's a huge inspiration for a lot of storytelling you'll see these days in certain films, but like I said, he's one of the classics, and you can't go wrong with that. But there are many others out there. You know, you can top off all those cinematic, you know, uh, directors and masters that are out there, guys like Kubrick and whatnot. Uh, and I do like their films a lot too, uh, to be quite honest. Uh, but I still love, you know, just stupid movies. Also, <laughs> they don't have to be these cinematic master classes of any type. Uh, even if they're just fun movies, just for the entertainment value and the story of it, I I'll definitely sit down and watch those too. You might have to restate that question again, Walking Pogo Stick, about how did you, you know, what's the achievement, that feeling of fulfillment without external validation? Kind of give me a bit more detail about that. Like, what do you mean? And, and maybe some, I don't know, examples? Because maybe I have, I'm not sure exactly, you know, in terms of how I can explain that part, but maybe just a little bit more explanation could be helpful for me. Again, laying down some general washes right now. I'm going to go into specific details into the uh, Tin Man right after this. Yeah, the gallery that you might have found it on, uh, I know that one gallery store does have the copies of the Dynamic Bible still, and they're called the um, Pop Secret Gallery, I believe. 
It's a gallery store in LA that's run by the um, Society of Illustrators. And I do believe they'll ship internationally. And of course, I'm sure you understand the cost of it is not pleasant. But uh, there was another place that's in Europe, in France, that had a lot of copies of it, but they sold out. They had like 300 copies, and they sold out of those. So the book still kind of goes pretty quickly, unfortunately. Well, fortunately for me, but unfortunately for other people. Um, I have a hard time keeping it in stock, but like I said, it, I'll, I'll be doing another reprint this coming year. And, you know, shipping from France would have been a lot cheaper. Yeah, so Gallery Nucleus still has it. Uh, let me see if I can even just find a link for you guys of that particular uh, gallery. I think it's called... Top Secret Gallery, I believe. Don't know if they actually had a storefront or not online. Maybe not. They might only sell through um, their store physically. Yeah, I can't find the website. That's too bad. Yeah, I had a few copies at San Diego. Uh, those books sold out, you know, within like the last, you know, the next or the the two or three days into Comic Con. Like I said, the book is still kind of sought after, uh, which I'm very pleasantly pleased about. Uh, it, it's been doing very well for me. Um, but like I said, the disappointment is the fact that I can't seem to keep it in stock enough. Uh, it's because it's so expensive to produce. The book was very expensive to make. Uh, the paper is really, really you know, high end. And I'm planning to maybe even like uh, adjust it for future prints where I can bring down the cost of the book as well. Um, obviously, I favor the much heavier quality paper, which is like a watercolor paper. But of course, for people that are out there, you know, the shipping cost is so much, and you know, there are some people that are, you know, not necessarily having all the, the money in the world to buy all the books they want. So I think offering a, a cheaper alternative with a, a lower quality paper might be better. Not a problem, uh, Walking Poco Stick. I'm just asking for a little bit of clarity. Yeah, so I guess the point of that question was, you know, said something about where I have enough, yet I still have the drive to improve. You know, uh, you want to know how did you discover that feeling? Well, a lot of it is because as much as I'm able to gain uh, from recognition or materials, whether it's even about making enough money, um, working on certain projects or with people, but at the end of the day, uh, I do it for me. I don't do it for anybody else, you know? And so the work that you guys have to produce for yourself in the future, again, is for you. Uh, I guess a, kind of a good analogy to this is like if you were a student of mine, okay, and you were in my class right now, and I gave you homework, and I said, this next week, I want you guys to be able to produce, you know, 20 pages of drawings. And you're going to be like, 20 pages, you know, like that's a lot of drawings per week. It's like, it is. It's very a heavy load for some people on top of many other things you got to do for other classes or work or whatever the case is. Now, most people will, of course, get the work done, right? They come into my class at the, the following week, they hand in the homework, we take a look at it together. Um, but the problem is the, the time that you put into it, the scheduling. For people that are not very good with their schedule, obviously they kind of wait, they procrastinate, or they got to work on other stuff, priority is somewhere else maybe. And so the quality of work maybe declines a little bit. Now, they do that because maybe you know, their interest is waning a little bit or because they want, to, they want to focus on something else rather than the class that they're doing with me. And that's happened before. Nothing wrong with that. People's interests are in many different places. But what happens at the end of the week, what you do is you finish the work and you hand it in. And you've got to finish it as fast as you can. So what that means is you're finishing the work for me, not for you. You're just doing it because obviously I gave you that as homework, right? So you're just going through the motions. You're just doing it as fast as you can. There's no real care put into it. And, uh, it's obvious. But if we had a different mindset, like you actually had the priority, the time, and the focus to put into it, you should be doing the work for you. When, I, when you guys are in my class, if you were in my class, uh, what I tell people is that you're not drawing for me. You're drawing for yourself. And if you can't even just enjoy just drawing for you, then you're not going to be able to find that level of passion and investment into it. Now, if you're able to draw it for yourself and you actually care about it, you'll obviously follow the guidelines much closer, the quality of the work will gain, 
the interest may maintain also in terms of consistency. But like I said, some people tend to kind of you know uh, grasp it at different levels. They, they have that moment of you know that light bulb that goes off a little bit in different sections of the time, uh, and some people kind of don't really assume or expect it to really like it the way thought, they thought they would. So as people are introduced to it, they start to see the results, and maybe over time. Uh, they kind of see the benefits and the long-term gains, they, they begin to fall in love with the process. Uh, and then they invest more time into it. But in the beginning, maybe you really don't, you know? So uh, that's also where I find myself, I'm able to maintain that same level of energy and drive, is because I produce it for me, not for anybody else. Because I love it doing that, you know, doing it that much. And if I maintain that mindset, I'll continue doing it for the rest of my life that way, for me. So question from NY Rock is, you know, did you uh, ever have an aha moment or learn a concept that led to a biggest, to the biggest art gains once you grasped it? I wouldn't necessarily say they're the biggest art gains, but they're definitely steady improvements. Uh, you know, another way to put that is like, for instance, you'll take a class, uh, whatever college or school you go to, and you'll listen to it. You might even try some of the homework, but you'll sit there and be like, I don't get it. I don't understand why this is so important. You might not even like it. And so you don't really care. It's kind of pertaining to what we're just talking about right now. Uh, you'll take a class, like even when I took a class at Art Center that had nothing to do with what I really wanted to do, I didn't care. So I didn't really focus on it as much as I probably should have. But some of the lessons stick because, you know, they kind of pops back in the memory. Uh, I'll be doing something for like a professional job and all of a sudden it's like, oh, that's what that person was talking about, you know? Some of the things would be things like in color. Like color was never really a thing for me. Like I understood it. Uh, but I was much more of a draw. I just loved drawing. I loved lying. I loved shapes. Color was such a perplexing thing for me. I had a hard time grasping it. And because it was so difficult, my interest waned on it. But later on, you start to see, like, man, color is really important, you know? Uh, and I start to see the, the benefits and the application to it when other people are using it, even on a professional level, definitely. So when I saw that happening, it's like, oh, that's what it is, you know? So I become much more conscious of that. Anyways, that's kind of those moments that maybe I've had a little bit of. But they're never really like big jumps or like moments of like, oh, okay, I completely understand now. It's just gradual, you know, growths of changes and understandings of things. And you, you have a memory of something else and it pops up and it's like makes you just kind of like step back a little bit uh, and realize what's going on. So it's about 8, oh, 7.43 right now, and I'm probably going to keep going uh, until this is done, actually. But uh, we'll see how much longer we go. I'm going to put a little bit of rusting color on him as well. A couple of little saturation spots popping up. five greatest artists alive alive right now well obviously it does depend on certain disciplines and industries as to where you're coming from but you know we won't overcomplicate it let's just say top five in my personal opinion right now within the industry that we focus on um, as we have mentioned before I still feel like Eliza or Eliza Ivanova is definitely on that list uh, I think her work has a sense of like subtlety and emotion and technical prowess and, and really just amazing level of control uh, that I really favor quite a bit. Uh, another person, you know, a second would be kind of someone similar in that same kind of vein is uh, Claire, Claire Wendling. I think she also is on that same kind of level. She's obviously a bit of a different generation where Elisa a bit younger uh, and, and Claire is a bit older. 
and she's been around the industry for a long time. But Claire Wendling is, in my opinion, also an incredibly, incredibly uh, gifted individual. But just in, you know, the amount of investment of time and skill that she's put in uh, definitely shows in her work. Personality-wise, she's the complete opposite of someone like uh, Eliza. <laughs> you know, some people are a little bit intimidated by uh, Wendling just by a bit when you kind of see her in person. Uh, I've hung out with her. We, we've spent some time, and, and she's actually an incredibly uh, wonderful person. And um, but again, people have to go by first impressions sometimes. A third on the great uh, list of artists that are alive currently, um, Tarada. Katia Tarada was one of my favorites always as a kid. Well, not a kid, younger person, teenage years. Uh, someone I also imitated heavily. Katia Tarada is currently in LA right now. I'm going to be doing some live drawing. Did one already at one of the bookstores. We'll be doing another one, I think, coming this this weekend. I usually try to go watch him. I'm not sure if I'm going to go make it this time around, but he is definitely uh, an icon for me. Um, another one is one that's not necessarily known by a large amount of people, or nor, nor a lot of people that I know in my, my group of community of friends. Uh, he is someone I found a couple of years ago, and, and he's a much older gentleman. He's probably around 85, 86 years old. And I've posted about him on Instagram, and people may know who I'm talking about if you follow me. But he goes by uh, Jean-Luc Vegin. Jean-Luc was an artist from uh, Belgium. He was born in 1934, and he grew up at the time when the Nazis invaded his hometown. He was five years old. Uh, he escaped and he grew up in Belgium, but he ended up working as an illustrator in aviation. He loved aviation. And um, a lot of his artwork and prints were posted in, in magazines uh, for the Belgium, some type of magazine for them. Um, and to this day, he still does some stuff for them. Now, he's like in his mid to late 80s now. And I met him about two or three years ago. And I've seen his work before. A lot of his prints, he does amazingly complex, detailed drawings of, of interiors of cockpits, airplane cockpits. And I fell in love with it. Uh, Jean-Luc, yes. Here, I'll spell it out for you. Uh, Jean-Luc Begin. Jean-Luc is, um, again, he's based here in California in San Pedro. And he's still active in terms of like, you know, producing drawings and whatnot. And uh, he was, again, well known for his cockpit drawings, but only within the world of aviation did people know about him. The common, you know, young person and artist have never, has never heard of Jean-Luc. Uh, he's put out one book just re like only like, two years ago through a publisher in, in Switzerland. And it's not produced in the US, it's not available. So again, people here who want to know about him can't really find that book. <laughs> um, so what we met, at the uh, air show. There's an air show here in California in, in uh, LA called the Planes of Fame air show. And it's all these classic World War II airplanes that go up. And so I was sitting with a table with my publisher at the time, who was the same guys that produced his book. Uh, and he came to the show one year, it was like two years ago, and he told me his name and everything. And I found out that he was the one that made these incredible illustrations. And so we got to talking, and we kind of built this, you know, a friendship and through conversation and whatnot. And then I would visit, you know, him in his house. Uh, I, you know, got to know his wife and, and know his, his couple of his kids and whatnot. And I, I would stop by, and he, sh you know, we just hang out, and he would show me all of his original work. He'd have like mountains, and mountains of drawings, um, in his garage. It was just incredible, all these originals. But like I said, it's like he hasn't really put himself out there, so not a lot of people know about what he does. But he's out there, you know, he's incredible. And I'm actually trying to actively get him into a gallery. Uh, the one at Gallery Nucleus, we've talked, and I want to get him in there as well too, uh, to show some of his original work. The problem is, you know, Jean-Luc won't sell his originals. And in gallery shows, you need pieces to sell, essentially. <laughs> so unless it's like a, a non-selling show, which most galleries won't do, because they want to get some type of, you know, return off of the, the event. But like I said, we're trying to negotiate on something like that. So John Luke would be th third, no fourth, fourth. Uh, fifth, last person living, one of the greatest right now I can think of. Man, it's such a hard, because again, even though I list five, there are a mountain of other people out there who are incredibly talented. Um, I'm trying to think of another one right now. 
I'm, I'm also thinking about it more from like a draftsman point of view, not necessarily like painters per se, because again, that's the type of, kind of, type of artist that I focus on. Um, he does have social media. He started up an Instagram just this year. Uh, so he's only been building it very slightly. And he runs it also, I think his daughter helps him out with it. <laughs> Cause again, the guy, the guy is you know much older. Uh, he's very, you know, astute and, astute and very focused and uh, clear-minded. He's very much still there. And again, like I said, he's very active in terms of like pr still producing work and drawing a lot. Um, so yeah, John Luke is awesome. Great guy. And the meaning, I have a video, a collection of videos uh, that when I visited his garage and we would sit down and talk, I have an interview with him actually. So I haven't really put it together just yet. I was actually looking for it early, the other week and I really want to cut it together and post it somewhere like on YouTube or something. So uh, it's an interview about him, about his history, how he got to art, uh, all that kind of stuff. So. But he does go by Jean-Luc Begin uh, on Instagram, and you'll find him on there. I need to also adjust this um, in one second. I wonder if I can do it live. The video is just a little bit um, washed out, just slightly. But I want to see if I can adjust this real quick. video and let me see if I can bring down the brightness just a little bit just so you can see the image a little bit better let's stick it right there uh, yes that's it Jean-Luc begin fifth fifth um, <laughs> damn it there's so many to choose from <coughs> I'm trying to think of ones that also I'm really just kind of connected to that not necessarily are kind of the go-to's for everybody. Well, I'm also even trying to think of like a comic artist that might be really good to think of. I'm playing a little bit of rat, uh, Rust. No, not myself. I mean, of course I would want to say guys like Kim Jong-gi because the guy is prolific at what he does. But it's obvious, you know, it's like, yeah, of course, the guy's crazy good. But I kind of want to mention someone else, it's not necessarily so obvious. Craig Mullins is someone definitely worth looking at, but, you know, he has different things that he offered that I think really altered the landscape of art entertainment design. So I don't disagree. I think Craig Mullins has definitely had an effect within our industry. But in terms of like my interests, Craig was never really a big influence. You know what? I would say um, Gurney, James Gurney, because he is someone I grew up with as a kid. But what I find about amazing with Gurney right now is really how active he is in engagement with his audience. He's someone I never thought like you would see his stuff, you know, active on social media. Like he does so many tutorials and posts on Instagram. Uh, I was always kind of shocked when I saw it. Because he's someone I grew up with, so I see this as someone like really kind of out there, you know? Like, he's kind of in the ether, and only people internally really know about him or know him in general. But the fact that he's so active in what he does, and I think that's what I also really, really gravitate towards, are people that are very still active on like putting stuff out, but active on producing their own stuff, like making their own thing. Like a lot of these guys uh, don't really work for studios, you know? They don't really work for companies anymore. Uh, even like Eliza, Eliza left Pixar, um, went on her own. Uh, you know, Jean Luc works on his own. Katya Torado works on his own. All these guys are very independent, and they and they produce their own thing actively, constantly. So, guys like James Gurney is also someone who I think could have just been in a studio or working in his office and kind of disappeared. You know, a lot of kids may have like seen his old books of Danotopia, but maybe would have never really known him. But the fact that he had, he's as active as he is, is kind of like kept his name really valid. Not to say that it wasn't valid in the first place. Internally, you know, within our industry, people, all, everybody knows who James Gurney is. But for the layman, for the, the common audience, people just out there would know what Dinotopia is, but now can have really full access to who this guy is also. Um, so I definitely would consider him to be, you know, currently one of the greatest at the moment because from a, a aesthetic standpoint, it's incredible. 
from a technique standpoint, again, really amazing techniques. But also just as a human level, <laughs> and also just uh, on the way he's able to share and connect to people, I think is also really incredible too. It, that's not the easiest thing to find when it comes to this kind of field, where you have someone, you know, um, who's who's good, but also very active in engagement and very good with his like the people that he's around. Um, you know, in this field, I'm sure you realize things like pride and ego can come up, and it does generate some individuals that are not necessarily good to be around, you know, or, or very nice to be around. But I do feel that um, James Gurney does have those attributes. He's just someone as an incredible person. So those are my five. <laughs> Living. In my opinion, greatest for the moment. Hard list, for sure. I find even things like movies to be incredibly hard to list. Like, I'm, I'm amazed I'm able to select five out of my head right now. It's one of those kind of impossible requests of things, like who's your favorite kind of. A little bit of rusting on there. I wanted to make sure that X in the background is dropped in value a little bit, so that way his, his uh, silhouette body form stands out just a little bit. How fast do I fill up an average sketchbook? Well, not as fast as some people might think. And the only reason why is because I juggle like five or six different sketchbooks at one time. <laughs> and each sketchbook kind of has its own specific focus behind it. For instance, this book I'm using right now uh, is more of my everyday go-to book. And it's a very large format. And it's, I, honestly, it's, this is like a nine, more than nine by 12. I don't even know what the size would be actually. Like an eight and a half, 11, a standard size. This is eight and a half by 11. Let me zoom out a little bit. So this piece of paper is eight and a half by 11, okay? So this sketchbook is definitely much larger than that. Um, I can't move the camera around too much. It's locked in place, but still, this is just standard size. So this book I'm using right now is much bigger. Uh, I picked up this sketchbook when I was in Austria doing my workshop out there in Austria. And it's a brand uh, which is known out there in, in Germany and Austria called Bosner. Uh, B-O-S-N-E-R, Bosner. So this water brush pen I'm using right now is also Bosner. So um, this one I picked up because I was just at the art store and I just bought it there. So the sketchbook I found I'm using right now is made from the same company. So the last book I was carrying around as a everyday carry took me about, I would say, a year, maybe nine months, close to a year to fill up completely. And that was over 245 pages, that sketchbook. And that's on top of other sketchbooks I'm using. So like I said, produce a good amount of drawings. I think if you just kind of broke it down just on average, you could definitely say that I have enough drawings. We could say it's a drawing per day in a year. So I definitely produce well above 300 to 400, close probably to 500 drawings a year. You know? And who knows, maybe more than that. But I'm just kind of thinking off the top of my head from sketchbooks. You know, this is from like uh, demo books to personal books to you know, professional work that I'm doing as well too. Um, it, it can be quite a bit. Uh, Neon asks, do you think drawing is something you can teach yourself or is it better to have someone guide you? Yes, you can teach yourself. Everybody teaches themselves at some point in the future, you know, when they're young. When you're young, you, you imitate, you copy. That's a form of learning. That's a form of something that you're doing to help understand how to do something. Okay, uh, from there, as you get a little bit older, you can look for resources online. 
uh, information and books and different tutorials and videos and that's another form of learning that you're just practicing and that's also something you can pick up on based on imitation based on what you're seeing uh, and any form of study again is a form of imitation copy remember do it again and then apply um, but does that mean that you know if you are learning by yourself that you're not going to be as good as someone who's going to like a school not necessarily I think you you learn differently and you miss out on certain things but that doesn't necessarily weaken you because what you then do is you adapt you find different ways of problem solving that potential issue uh, that many artists will face at the same time people who go to a more formulaic method of school also learns a lot of these lessons but then also miss out on, on things as well you know which is being independent which is about being able to solve problems on their own and not relying upon someone to give them the answers to something you know so there's benefits on both ends and I think honestly using both sides of it where you should be very proactive on trying to actively always learn by yourself at the same time you should take advantage of the schools and platforms and educational you know directions that are out there in any sort of format online or physical schools or you know even just tutorials and streams like this so each outlet has something to gain from there's no one spot that's going to give you everything at one time there never was uh, but now it's just that we have many more options in terms of how we can do it back then you only resorted to one because that's all you had So, um, Sintanarte asks, what to draw to practice? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you're drawing to practice. The question is, are you just drawing in the first place? You could be drawing people, you could be drawing shapes, you could be drawing animals, you could be drawing something out of your head, you could be drawing things, something that you saw from another artist. It doesn't matter what you're drawing. The question is, are you drawing, right? And are you drawing every single day? That's it. That's all it is. Are you the type to have pages where there's only some small thing in the corner every bunch of pages? Not necessarily. I mean, this is, you know, the entire sketch page right now. I mean, I can even go through the sketchbook at the very moment. Uh, if I just zoom in a little bit. I mean, this is a book I had just started. So I'm only in about, let's see how many pages we have for this particular book. I started this book literally less than a month ago okay uh, here's the first page here's the second page here's two three four five six seven eight So, you know, this particular book that I've been using on top of uh, demo drawings I would do in class, uh, work I would do professionally, other stuff that I'm working on, you know, you're probably talking about, you know, a drawing per day. And this is a full size piece that I'm doing right now. The sketchbook name is a company called Bosner. This is a company. Bosner, B-O-E-S-N-E-R. I don't know if you can find it online. I found it at the art store in Austria. I'll probably pick up another one because I might be back in Austria in April. So Jay, in terms of like my uh, classes by online, uh, yes, Shopify, my storefront, will be selling the classes uh, through a limited number of seats. And then it's no test. There's no interview. Anybody can take it to whatever degree of level of, of uh, experience. Um, and that's it. So it's first come, first serve. When it sells out, it sells out. So this paper actually is pretty thick. Uh, this is a, probably about a 60 pound paper. Um, it's got a slight cream to it. It's not like stark white. As you can see, like even this um, copy paper is much whiter. So it's got a little bit of a cream to it. 
but it doesn't really affect it. It does buckle a little bit, as you can see from the paper. As you look at the back side of it, it buckles slightly. But it's not completely bleeding through. So as I you know, let it dry and I press it down and close the book, let it sit overnight, it'll flatten out. But this paper is very much like a, a hot press watercolor paper. So as you can see in some of these areas, like there, the, the fibers of the paper are kind of picking up. So this brush pen, as I work into it, it's rolling the paper into little, little balls like that. So it's fiber that's coming off. And I personally don't like that, but it doesn't necessarily break the feeling of the drawing for me or uh, how I'm doing it. It's just a small little annoyance. Anyways, uh, let me even zoom in closer. Closer. I'm going to shift this sketchbook. I can go a little bit higher. So you can kind of see how it just looks up close. Do I usually have something in the background when I draw? Typically, when I would have like a, a movie or a, a show going on. Actually, I've been re-watching uh, The Simpsons again. Because <laughs> I do have Disney Plus, and they have the entire you know uh, season, all the seasons of The Simpsons on there. So I've been watching it from the very beginning again, uh, and kind of being reminded how amazing the, the show The Simpsons is. I'm on, only on season three. Uh, I have never watched uh, an episode of The Simpsons lately at all. In the recent, maybe, two years, three years. I haven't seen any new shows. I refuse to see them. But the old ones, oh my god, they're so good. Uh, I will not be teaching dynamic sketching on CGMA in the future. Simple as that. I will be doing the mentorships, but I will not be teaching the classes there. The only place you'll be able to take the class online with me uh, is through my own classes. And I'm going to zoom out a little bit so you can kind of see how I'm mixing colors as well. You know, as you guys come in here, it's good that you continue to engage with each other. Um, seems like some of you may might even know each other uh, and if you do you know using this opportunity to kind of like talk and engage in, with others as well uh, building a network getting a sense of like how people approach things kind of like what you guys are doing right now I think it's actually very favorable stuff uh, the big benefit you know classrooms is, is that opportunity to be able to actually work off of each other uh, ha having that comparison is actually incred incredibly important I know that things like competition can be scary for some they, they think that oh I'm not going to be as good and you want to be better because based on that, you, you, you come off stronger or you feel like you're more confident. But like I said, in any sort of classroom situation, you actually want to be the weakest in the class. And by having that approach, the idea is that you want to always look for others that you're looking up at and be like, I need to find some way, somehow, to get up to that level as well. Whatever it takes, you know, time, you know, interest, focus networking groups of people constantly working on hours of time whatever the case is um, I think it's important to get that kind of like you know comparison and it's friendly competition the idea is you're also helping others out, each other out you're not necessarily squashing each other but just something to keep in mind plants and the flowers in the background. I'm actually almost done with this, so it's about 8.10 at the moment. I'll probably end up going for 15, 20 minutes more. And then we'll call this session good for the moment because, um, honestly, I know I, I want certain things better uh, for the next feed, audio-wise and also video-wise. Uh, I definitely want to figure out this 
power solution in terms of it sleeping. The audio, I don't know just yet. Um, hopefully I can find someone to solve that because I thought it would auto automatically be good because I'm using a really good mic, but it sucks that it's not working so well. So It works nicely because it's the same mic I use for my uh, online classes, and it, everyone says it sounds great, but I don't know why the stream is making it worse. It might be something on OBS, but I'm going to look into that other... Uh, streaming platform, the stream element, and maybe that will help in terms of quality. Yeah, I think I'm going to try to do next time, just let the audio go off the camera instead. Uh, I wonder if I can even do that now. Give me one second. Let's see what happens. Um, it doesn't seem like... Well, no, I can't do it because I turned the mic down on the, uh, the camera, so <laughs> there's no audio going into it. Well, there is, but it's muted, so next time. It, they did, and I looked at that, uh, Nicaro Art, the Twitch version of it, but they don't have uh, an audio option for the camera. Or if they do, I'm not seeing it. Uh, they have it for a live feed where you can record off your screen, but not through a camcorder. I, I looked through it for a really long time, and either I'm just not seeing it, or I don't know how to work it properly. So, No, I have a dedicated mic. I'm using the Yeti. Uh, the Blue Yeti professional one. It's hooked up to my computer right now. I have it as actual input, audio input, through OBS. And it's capturing the audio. I see all the, um, it's actually two audio inputs going on. Let's take that out. So I don't know what's going on for that. In fact, let me see if the desktop audio will pick up. No, that won't even work either. Anyways. Yeah, no, I have a good mic. I, I spent, you know, $150 on it, <laughs> so well, it's, it's a medium quality mic, but good enough. It should have been good enough, but again, like I said, it works well for all the other things, but for some reason right now, it's not working so well, so. It's the uh, Yeti, uh, the Y-E-T-I brand, Yeti brand. It's the um, blue one, the professional. It's a good mic. I do like it quite a bit, but like I said, I'll test out other options or I'll try to, you know, fiddle around with the um, audio settings in the future. Which is disappointment because I wouldn't want to just switch to something else if I had this great mic and I bought it and I can't use it. That would suck. So. No, I see one now. It's just one. It's the same one. Like, even if I increase the decibels, it's not really going to help because I think you guys hear a lot of static and noise. Like, I just increase it a little bit right now. Um, filters, no filters. Properties, microphone, Yeti. Um... Yeah, everything else seems kind of default, so, anyways. That's so weird, a lot of static noise, because there's like no other noise in here. <laughs> I wonder if it's because my... No, that wouldn't be it. Anyways, whatever. Again, next time, I'll figure it out. Well, does anybody else have any last comments, questions... Uh, things you want to get into before I leave for this session. Uh, for a reminder for someone of you that joined a little bit later on, I will be back uh, for Monday because I plan to do two streams a week and hopefully next time everything else will be settled, technical wise.
And I hope you guys are enjoying at least, you know, some of the information that's being thrown out. Uh, please use it to whatever degree you can, especially in terms of the lessons in the beginning. For those of you that missed it, I will put up that snippet of it uh, in the highlight section later on tonight. And of course, I do appreciate people coming in just um, sharing thoughts and asking questions, engaging. That is the whole point of this kind of a streaming purpose. But again, I do apologize about the technical aspects of it. Um, first time using some of these things, so hopefully it'll smooth out as we go into the future uh, with some of this stuff. Appreciate you guys, thank you again. So we are pretty much done with this piece with the um, Tin Man. Actually, I'll even show you the one before. This is the Tin Man from before. He's terrifying. <laughs> and so I did this one yesterday and I was like, oh man, like it's kind of scary looking. Kind of made him really like, almost Joker-like. Uh, so I didn't post it, I was like, yeah, I'll finish it and I'll do it. It's like, okay, I'll, I'll see what happens. but. I, I you know, got to a certain point and in technical parts of it looked okay and, and I didn't mind it but some of the proportioning I'm still like eh, like whatever and I'm, I'm not sure about the, the creepiness factor of it. <laughs> it kind of happened that way because I made his eyes vacuous like he's kind of turned off a little bit. Um, so I really wanted to go for something a little bit more charming I guess which is why I wanted to go for something like this. Uh, I don't know. Somewhat the same but not really. So last question from Wolf of Art is, how do you avoid burning out? What do you do to feel refreshed, like live drawing or traveling with a sketchbook? Are those some of those things? Um, yes, a lot of it is getting out of your room. So I, I leave and I go to locations. I'll go to like a museum, back to a zoo, or some you know spot that I can go take photographs or draw, or even just go to a cafe or a bar and hang out with friends if I need to. Uh, I don't want to stay locked in my room. Because if you just stay inside and try to solve it by just kind of hammering through, it's not really going to work. Um, that's where you'll burn yourself out because you're forcing it and you have to get into that mindset where you don't have to force it it just happens because you want to do it you know uh, so that's one of my main kind of advices is to get out of your element and to leave and, and kind of refresh yourself through other means you know through a visual stimulus you could be like you're watching a movie engaging with friends uh, having a social time that your brain kind of recoup a little bit and you might think but I'm wasting time now I shouldn't be doing that I should be working but you have to realize when you work that way, when you finish it, it's not going to come out to the, the, the result that you want to. And if you spent a little bit of time, even a little bit, just for yourself, for doing something that, you know, that encourages you, that builds that visual library or uh, interest and excitement or inspiration, in the long run, it could have a much more positive outcome. It will also make you, you know, produce more work better too. So in my opinion, I think having those external, you know, interests are a very good thing. Don't think of them as distractions. And I think what people also get mixed up in is they think of them as something that they're guilty about, that they shouldn't be doing. But that's not the way to think about it. it. All experiences, anything that you do, adds to your understanding as an artist, storytelling-wise, whatever the case is. So if someone says, hey, let's go out and draw somewhere else, you should definitely always say yes. Okay? Don't say, oh, I'm busy, I'm working on something. Go out and do it, even if it's only for an hour or two. But then people think it's like, oh, but I don't want to leave my house. I'm lazy. Well, that's something you got to change yourself. You know, it's like if you're too lazy to step outside of your room, that's something more internally for yourself that you have to get over. Uh, and I know a lot of friends that are like that. It's like, oh, I'm home. I'm comfortable. I don't want to go out. But for me, I always try to make a way to get out there, you know. Um, but that's, again, one of those things that you have to now think about. Yeah, I don't know if you can download the videos, can you? Because if anybody does have the first, the very first uh, stream, that'd be great because I don't have it. <laughs> uh, I missed the download of it, so it disappeared on me. I only have number two up till now, so. Exactly. That's what people say. That's why I had the hardest time in San Diego. Uh, when I was in San Diego, I would try to start my own classes and have, like, workshops and stuff, and I would run them and nobody would come out. Nobody. Because they're all comfortable at home. Like, I don't want to leave and drive 20, 30 minutes somewhere, you know? But that's the thing, man. I mean, for me, like, even yesterday, I went out to a, a drawing meetup. Next week, I'm going to do another one. I, I meet up with friends every Wednesdays or Thursdays. I go out. I have to. Yeah. 
I'm going to do a, a little bit of a tree and a branch in the background. just to break up this composition a little bit. I kind of just saw that in my head real briefly, and I just felt like I had to put it in there. Somebody asked a question about Lightbox too. Um, I will definitely be there for next year. I haven't signed up for my table just yet. Uh, for professionals or people that were there for this year, they've already sent out a link to apply for a table. Uh, I haven't done it yet. I'm not in any rush, honestly. <laughs> so um, I'll apply for it sometime next year. But yeah, I will, I will definitely be around. And I have a lot of traveling to do, uh, starting in April, going into um, all the way through September. I'll be in some country. I'll be in Rome. I'll be in Austria. I'll be in Paris. I'll be in Australia. I'll be in, um, where else is there? Croatia. See, I'll be in quite a few places. Oh, you've heard of mixed things about Lightbox. Well, I will say that it's, damn it, sorry. I will say that it's a, it's a great show for general purposes of like art, design, animation. It doesn't have a specific focus to it. So because of that, it's more for the general. Uh, still students can engage and, and take advantage of the fact that you have a lot of different kinds of artists there. So I, th I think it's a good show for that. I know that the, uh, like the workshops and stuff like that weren't run the smoothest, but no show ever is. Especially for the first one, I thought they did a pretty good job. Um, it could have been much worse, honestly. Much, much worse. But hopefully they'll solve a lot of the problems for next year, which I saw. Uh, I ran into it myself when I was doing my own workshops, you know. Networking Educational, uh, they have a lot of artist alleys, they have a lot of professionals showing their work and selling their wares, books and prints and whatnot. I was there selling a few things, but not really a lot. I didn't really have that much anyways. So I just kind of showed up more for networking. I just set up a monitor in my table and I just drew, <laughs> mostly. And then I did a, like, a couple of series of workshops and talks. And it was good. Um, but again, my experience with things like the workshops, in my personal opinion, could have been a lot better run. Not from my end, but more from more light pots. There were things technically that just kind of failed. Uh, they didn't have enough people, and the spacing was too small. And the people waiting in lines for hours on end, some of them didn't get in, but they weren't told that they couldn't get in, you know, uh, until the very end of it. And so they're sitting there waiting for hours for nothing. So I think they could do a better job on that in terms of communicating, you know. And, and that's been a problem with many shows. They, just, they don't communicate enough to everyone. Uh, for instance, the, one of the workshops I did for the Sketching with Intention you know, we had about a hundred and something people waiting for it, but the room has a certain capacity. They know this, but if you know there's a certain number of people already in the crowd, you should be able to go back there saying, this is the end of the line. There's no more room for it, but there was nobody there, you know, not until you get to the door. And you're like, oh, they're filled now. You can't come in. That's ridiculous, in my opinion. Yeah, granted, it's free. You're not really paying for it, but still, it would be helpful if there's a little bit of communication, you know, just as courtesy for the show. Exactly. And I don't think that shows a lot of coordination. Uh, you know, again, like I said, people, they can argue the fact that hey, we're not charging you anything for this. So, but still, just for common, you know, decency <laughs> of being able to make people understand how things are working, they should do that. I would do that. But hopefully, they'll learn. And so that what happened with my workshop was that I came in, uh, and we we're doing the lecture. Again, the room was filled to capacity. And we started up, 10 minutes goes by, 
and I hooked up the projector to my computer to kind of show some images, and the, the da damn HDMI cable broke. It snapped. It was an adapter piece. So, they, oh, shoot, that's not working. So they had another one, a backup, and plugged that one in, and that one broke because they had been used for the entire show, you know, constantly. So they were just worn down. So there was nobody in the room to support me, just the cameraman. And so he comes up and tries to help out, and they call people in. And we're spending 20 minutes trying to figure out how to do this thing. And they're just kind of finagling it, you know? And it's just not working. And so I literally said, we're getting the hell out of here. So I picked up everybody in the room and left the place. And they were still, you know, playing with the projector. And I said, no, forget it. Forget about it. So we just left. And so I took everybody into the hallway of Lightbox, and we just did the presentation there on the wall. I just put up a big piece of, piece of paper and just talked in front of people. Um, now, of course, there was a fire code, so they're like, no, you can't be here, there's a you know, fire code, that kind of thing. Because there were, again, like 100 people you know, just sitting in front of the hallways. So they're right, where can we go? They said, we don't know. So I looked for a spot, and I grabbed everybody again. We went downstairs, and I found this little nook that we just kind of crammed everybody in. And uh, again, it could have been a fire code issue, but the people just let me do what I was going to do. And honestly, I wasn't going to care what they said. I was going to just keep going. And I did. I just talked for them for like two hours straight. Um, you know, granted it was supposed to be only an hour, but I sat there and just kind of, you know, talked with them as much as long as I could. Um, oh, were you at that one? Yeah. So again, it's like, that's a very frustrating moment. For most artists that are at that show, if something like that happened, honestly, it's like, they would have said, oh, this is the end of my time. I, unfortunately, it didn't work out. Let's see you next time. They would have left, you know. But I knew that I came in that morning, there were a line of people there. It's like, I can't just leave. That's not really going to work that way. It doesn't make me look you know, obviously professional, and it doesn't make Lightbox look professional. I'm representing Lightbox in a lot of ways, too. So if, if this is going to work, I have to sit around and, and make it work. So that's what we had to do, um, no matter what people said. So, I mean, that's what hopefully will make that kind of experience of Lightbox worth it for people to come back to. So that's what I want. I want every show to be, you know, a very positive experience for people. CTN, Lightbox, whatever show there is, anything I'm engaged with, it's got to be something that people are going to, you know, obviously get something of their time investment because you guys are the ones coming all the way out to see us and supporting what we're doing. So obviously, you know, if, if artists are not willing to engage on that same level of intensity, then honestly, they're, they're not doing it right. Anyways, I had to add a tree. So I thought that would have added, created a nice little composition to this. So. Now I kind of like this approach because it makes it feel like a, a Bill Watterson piece, like a Calvin and Hobbes. All right, cool. Well, this is how we'll end. A um, little bit of talk, a little bit of questions, some technical problems. Thanks, you guys, for sticking around. Uh, it was a good amount of you that came out and watched this. Uh, I'm glad for all the questions and engagements. It's good to see some of you guys networking and connecting together. Uh, we'll be doing it again on Monday evening time and hopefully by then we'll hopefully solve some of the issues um, and we'll talk more then all right so thank you guys for showing up and uh, enjoy the evening day morning whatever the case is wherever you're at and um, if I don't see you on Monday hopefully in the future but I will be definitely back on next week Monday and Thursdays uh, evening time so thank you guys I'll see you guys then